Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Meek, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. You have scored numerous interviews and done, I mean, you probably conduct, how many interviews do you think you've conducted through your time? Oh, just on Je on the Kennedy assassination, you mean? You can add all of them if you want. Um, a few thousand. It's a lot. I write, a few, I write several other things for our newspaper. Um, I also have done a column since 2007 on military veterans, their oral histories. And I've done uh, probably a little over 400 of those, and most of them are preserved at the Library of Congress as part of the Veterans History Project. If you go to their website uh, and you click on uh, you know, who's, who's in, whose story is in, and you type in Jeffrey L. Meek as the contributor, uh, you'll see the, all of them listed. And I think almost 50% of them are now have now been digitized, and you can actually watch them. And when I started that, it was all World War II veterans. And that was my first book, They Answered the Call. World War II veterans share their stories. And there were 75 World War II veteran stories in that. And then just last year, about a year ago, I published a second book of 85 more stories called War Stories. And that's a, a chapter on World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, and the War on Terror. So that and covering things like public works and lakes committees and many other things, I'm sure I've done several thousand interviews. What about when you got interested in the JFK stuff? Um, well, I initially got um, interested in it back in 1975. Um, are you asking about that or how did the, the JFK... Well, if you've conducted so many varying subjects from World War II to public works, I'm wondering why the JFK one was so noticeable or just caught your eye. I mean, it's important that you got these people on record at least stating some things because you know that's all my generation has to look back on. Yeah. Well, I first got interested in the assassination back in 1975, March 6, 75, when Grodin showed the uh, Zapruder film. And that's when I was a teacher, a basketball coach, and an athletic director. And, uh, you know, I went down and visited Mary Farrell a few times, was very active uh, in reading and researching from about 1975 to the late 90s, um, you know, doing interviews. I remember one of the uh, Last ones I did back at that time were was with um, oh gosh uh, the guy who wrote the book Mob Lawyer. Oh, shit, I think I know who it is too, and I'm blanking on the name. Yeah, um, I have an excuse. I worked an overnight shift. Yeah, I'm blanking on the name too. The book is there, but I can't see the name. Um, <clears throat> and then for about twenty years, I. You know, I would buy a book or two uh, and stay with it in, in terms of reading. But in terms of ac actually doing active research, I didn't for about 20 years. And then, uh, you know, life got in the way and so on. And I was teaching and coaching. And with the athletic director job, I was working six, seven days a week for several years. And then when the documents started coming uh, uh, more readily available in 2017, that kind of kickstarted me again. And and um, I decided to go back through what I had. I had hundreds of hours of programming on those little cassette tapes. And I borrowed a friend's uh, recorder uh, that would convert them to CD. And so spending several hours with that, sitting there listening to that, you know, names would come up and I was just kind of verifying. You know, let's see, Mike Howard. I think that was a Secret Service agent who interrogated um, Marina Oswald. And so while I'm listening, I'm checking things on my phone. And I, I saw that Agent Howard lived in McKinney, Texas. And our son had just moved over here to Frisco, Texas. And we drive through McKinney to go to his house. This was before we moved to Texas. So I contacted him and interviewed him uh, at length in uh, February and March of 2018. And that really got me going to want to do some more, uh, you know, research. And so every time I would, my wife and I would drive over to see our son, I'd set something up, um, you know, with the Newmans or somebody, Robert Grode and somebody. And uh, that turned into a magazine that we did in our newspaper for November of 2018. And um, 
In 2019, we moved here to Texas, and I retired as managing editor of the Hot Springs Village Voice. And then, you know, four or five months later, COVID hit, and the newspaper could use anything you could send in because, you know, meetings stopped, and, you know, we all went through that. And so every once in a while, I would send something over, and I attended some programs down at the uh, Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza and would write that up, send it in. And uh, the managing editor at that time who uh, took my place said that she was getting a couple of uh, emails on occasion saying, why isn't there anything about JFK in the newspaper? Well, the reason was because Jeff didn't send anything in. So, Jeff, would you want to start a, a monthly column on the Kennedy, on the Kennedy assassination? And I said, yes. And so to keep it more broad uh, and not just on the assassination, you know, you could write about the administration or, you know, related things to his administration and time in office. We chose the JFK files. Uh, I believe that was in September of 2020. So that's when it started. Um, we've had uh, the columns gone for almost four years now. I think we're the only newspaper in the country that devotes a a weekly story about JFK or his administration. And uh, readership is good. Um, <clears throat> I get asked from time to time to, to give uh, presentations, both in Arkansas and over here in Texas. And so that's how it came about. Um, Where did you come across the name Moore's Wolf? I saw an interview or heard an interview done by uh, Jeff Morley and Larry Schnauf. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting because he knew, uh, because Wolf knew Warren Commissioner John Sherman Cooper. And I, I was a, a, a bit aware of uh, John Sherman Cooper's thinking on the assassination after reading uh, Jim DiEginio's The JF, uh, JFK Revisited um, and seeing the documentary, which I thought was very well done. And so uh, I contacted Jeff Morley, and he uh, gave me contact information for Morris. And so I contacted him and set up uh, an interview, oh, I guess maybe about three or four months ago. And so that's how it started, um, just wanting to do an interview with him about his association with uh, John Sherman Cooper. But um, in doing a little research before talking with him and and the conversations, uh, you know, it, it led to some other things, as you know, because you read my articles. And then I also got a copy of his book called Lucky Conversations. And just amazed at all the people that he's met over the, the years. I mean, from Malcolm X to Carl Sandburg to Nelson Mandela and just all sorts of other people. And so, uh, you know, we just started talking about um, how, how'd you end up in Washington? And, uh, you know, he went to Yale Law School and then uh, he was invited to work for Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And he was assigned to the Office of Legal Counsel, which gave him direct access to RFK. So he, he got to know him pretty well. And uh, Moore said that he uh, helped work on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, uh, he, you know, in, in so doing, he also got to know President Kennedy. And from time to time, Moore said that he became a personal courier of information between the Kennedy brothers, uh, which we spoke more about uh, later on. But, you know, then we got to, uh, so tell me about John Sherman Cooper and how that come about. And so he... Hold on, before, before we get to John Sherman Cooper, I got to ask about the delivering messages between the Kennedys. Did it explain any of like the brother rivalry? I have a brother, so there's obviously a little bit of brother friendly brother co competition. And also, did they voice any opinions about anybody in their administration like LBJ or Hoover? Any problems between them? Yes, he did. Um, not until the, the second time. He did mention the uh, competitive nature of the brothers uh, and that came about um, in April of 63 when Morris had invited. Uh, he, Morris was very much involved in an organization called the International Association of Students in Economics and Business. And it was mostly young people. And he invited the presidents of these uh, 
different chapters across, you know, the country, really, and elsewhere. And uh, he invited them to Washington for their national meeting. And uh, Bobby heard about it. And so he wanted to hold a nice reception for these young leaders. And Moore said he held a really nice party. Well, his brother, John, found out about it. Here comes the rivalry. And uh, uh, John said, well, you know, could we get him over here? And, and I get to meet him, too, which they did. And uh, also about rivalry and all that, he went into it more in the in latter uh, stages of our interviews that uh, one of the reasons he became a courier, according to Morris, was uh, they didn't trust Hoover. And Hoover didn't want Bobby in his office, in, in the office of attorney general. So he would take messages. He said he would ride his bicycle over to the White House and the uh, Secret Service agents would let him in. And, you know, he got to know Evelyn Lincoln a little bit and, and he would del deliver these messages. And sometimes Kennedy would ask him just to step into the office and because he wanted to respond to the message and have more take a, a message back to, to Bobby. So, yeah, there was that rivalry between the brothers, um, and there was no love lost between Hoover and, and the Kennedys, for sure, as we all know by now. You said he didn't trust Hoover to deliver messages, but would he be afraid that Hoover would be wiretapping or doing anything of that we know that Hoover would usually do when it came to you know phone conversations between the brothers or anything of that sort? It would make you think so. I mean, Morris didn't say that. I don't, I don't know. I haven't read anything about that, but there must have been some reason why uh, Bobby wanted to, Bobby and John wanted to have Morris as a, as a courier. How old and was Morris at the time? One would think that's why. How, how old was Morris at the time? I, did, I don't know. Okay. Because you said I, he was riding his bicycle. I'm starting to think like he's not a kid, though. He must be younger, though. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how old he was in the early 60s. Okay. And uh, did I, well, he's I think he's in his 80s now. So if we go back, 40, oh, he had to be young, what mid 20s, late 20s, yeah, yeah, something so, like that. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know how often people would stop just a kid delivering a message on a bicycle, even think that he was delivering a message. It doesn't seem like Hoover's MO. Hoover would be more interested in phone call conversations or bugging rooms to be able to find out that information. So that's actually smart on the Kennedy brothers to see that as a good way to communicate. Yeah, for sure. I kind agree. of scares you about the inner politics, though, of the White House at the time. Yeah, well, we all know about Hoover now, don't we? <laughs> yeah, very much so. Did he Did he ever make comments on LBJ? Uh, he did. Uh, in our second interview, he mentioned that uh, the Kennedys were thinking of dumping LBJ <clears throat> and um, replacing him with uh, North Carolina Senator uh Terry Sanford, uh, and that uh, Morris said that Bobby said to him that there were things that LBJ had done that they were not proud of, and that's Morris's quote. Uh, so uh, he did mention that about the Kennedys and LBJ. Now, back to your first interview that you had with him when you guys talked about Sherman Co John Sherman Cooper. Do you mind explaining a little bit who Senator John Sherman Cooper was, just for anyone out there who might not know? And then we can get into some details about the conversations that Morris Wolf and Senator John Cooper had with him. Well, uh, Senator John Sherman Cooper was from Kentucky, and he was asked to, to be one of the seven Warren commissioners. And Morris told me that... Uh, he was honored to be named, but he didn't really, Morris's word, he didn't, words were that he didn't accept it with any glee or, or happiness, but he accepted it because he saw it as part of his duty. Starts to sound like most of the other commission members. Mm -hmm. And according to Morris, um, John Sherman Cooper just saw this as going to be a, a rush to judgment, uh, get the matter resolved and, and get it behind us. And Morris said that Cooper uh, just despised the single bullet theory. And um, let's see if I can find one of Morris's quotes here. Um, Morris said that, um, in his opinion, Morris's opinion, that the very people who uh, supported the single bullet theory really didn't agree with it. And, and you know, they took this public stance. 
uh, as a way of just getting on with things, um, just getting it off the table is what the words that Morris used. But um, <clears throat> Morris said that there was a time when uh, one night they were just sitting sitting together and opening letters dealing with the, the Warren Commission and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which Morris uh, played a role in, in writing, uh, helping uh, Bobby Kennedy with that. And in regards to those letters and the Warren Commission, you know, he, he spoke to Cooper about it and Cooper would just shrug and say, there isn't really anything we can do. You know, the, the man is dead. And uh, just wanting to get it off their plate. Did it seem like when he was saying something like that to you that it was boasting up the kind of the point of view that these people felt like they had a duty to their country, which was to make sure that there wasn't any more shooters because of the fact that there could be another war going on if they decided to go invade another country over these acts that happened to Kennedy? I think so. Uh, I think that was a, a fear by some and um, LBJ. I think he actually mentioned that when he tried to uh, get Warren. Earl Warren, uh, as as uh, you know, head of the Warren Commission, um, that there could be a, a war over this. It was, you know, I think you know Kennedy's military certainly wanted him to, and had for over a year wanted him to invade Cuba, and uh, you know where would that lead? And then uh, if he did that, would there be ten, would there be trouble in Berlin? And what could happen if? Our military uh, invaded Cuba. What could that lead to? And that was the, you know, the the predicament I think that Kennedy was in for uh, the whole time he was in his administration. Uh, you know, behind the scenes, Kennedy's looking for ways to find peaceful solutions with the United States and Cuba and the United States and uh, Russia. And all the while, he's dealing with a military who's just itching to pull the trigger somewhere. You know, he's winding out of Vietnam. He uh, didn't want to get involved any deeper in Laos. He's, uh, he didn't invade. You know, he pulled the air cover for the Bay of Pigs. He didn't invade after the uh, missiles were found in Cuba in October of 62. And all the while, he's, you know, he's being uh, pushed to, to do something about it. And at the same time, he's back channel ways to try to find some peaceful solutions. And in, in looking at uh, back at that time, you know, I came across uh, information about how in 63, and if I remember right, the idea started in 61, but the, to me, this is the, the insanity of the military at the time, is they, they were thinking about having an all-out nuclear attack on Russia. And while we're at it, let's let's do China. While we have this missile advantage, and and let's just all out nuclear attack. And um, somebody I don't remember who, or if I even knew who, but somebody spoke up and said, "You know, if we do that, we're not going to get all the Russian mil uh, missile sites, and they'll fire some back at us." And uh, someone uh, said, "Yeah, you know that that's probably true, but you know." Um, they might kill five million Americans, but we'll get we'll get through it. We'll get past it. And that's the insanity to me. That's the insanity of the military back then that they were willing to to go ahead with something like that. And if five million Americans were killed, eh, so what? They make fun of the guy in band class who, out of the whole orchestra, just plays the triangle. But that one person that voiced their opinion was the guy playing the triangle. <laughs> Smartest so, one of the bunch. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and Morris talked about how uh, Kennedy had a deep passion for peace. Uh, Morris said he helped actually write uh, parts of the June 10th, 1963, what we know as the peace speech at American University. And Morris said, you know, he, he was just a, a guy who had a deep passion for no more death and wars and stupid uh, conflicts, and uh, he was just in a tough spot. I'll clip. I'll clip it out. Don't worry. Um, if we when we talk about Senator John Sherman Cooper, 
and his respect for Earl Warren. Why would he sign up for the thing even though he wasn't so happy to sign up for it? Was it because of Earl Warren and just his understanding of Earl Warren's career and also maybe he had a connection or personal relationship with Earl Warren? Not that I'm aware of. Morris didn't say anything about the relationship of, uh, of Cooper to any of the other Warren commissioners. Um, I'm unaware of the pitch that LBJ made to Cooper. Maybe it was the same one he gave to to Earl Warren about, you know, this could lead to a war. But no, he didn't. He didn't talk, and I'm unaware of any um, relationship, the degree of any relationship between any of the Warren commissioners. He uh, Morris also talked about um, Arlen Specter, you know, as we were talking about the single bullet theory, and. Uh, that they became really good friends. In fact, he was uh, Morris's best man at his wedding. Oh, don't tell me that, man. Yeah, and they played squash together. <clears throat> but um, Spectre just wouldn't talk about it. And he said that Spectre was a very ambitious guy and would take, uh, you know, would take advantage of uh, chance to to advance and so on. Those are not his his words, but he called them very ambitious. But yeah, he said they were squash partners and played once or twice a week in Philadelphia in, back in, um, I think he said 1965. He said, he, um, you know, he's the best man in his wedding and he was a very nice person, but he he did not talk about the single bullet theory. Did he ask why or ask to have any thoughts about why? I mean, that's what he ran is like his whole political campaign was based on this work that he did for the Warren Commission with the single bullet theory. No, he didn't. He just said he was very compartmentalized. He was a very busy DA with plans for more. Um, Morris just feels that, that the Warren Commission was basically done and packaged in a very political document. Uh, and the government just wanted to, to move on. Did Morris have any thoughts on who actually did the assassination, or if he had any thoughts on if Lee Harvey Oswald was the single assassin? Well, Morris believes that Oswald did not act alone and that he was used um, by others and that the Russians may have been involved. And Morris said that he he sees Oswald as uh, kind of a crutch, a distraction, but, but involved. And he thinks that maybe in the next 10 years, that was the number he used, that something might... Uh, come out of Russia about the case. And I found that to be an interesting statement because uh, back in uh, 2022, uh, I interviewed Assassination Records Review Board Chairman John Thunheim. And Thunheim told me that uh, the ARRB had an agreement with Russia for KGB records. And that there was like a five foot tall stack of KGB records and that the board was going to pay Russia $100,000 to, to get these documents. And so it was my understanding from that interview that that was kind of all in place and, and then, you know, agreed upon and then they backed out. Yeah. He, he told me that too. He also said that the secret service was one of probably the most trouble he dealt with trying to get files because they happened to destroy files after he requested for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's right in their report. I mean, you talk about, a middle finger to the JFK Records Act. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. But uh, uh, Wolf believes that uh, Oswald fired some shots, but that the conspiracy, the, the investigation of a conspiracy did not go far enough. And he believes that Kennedy, Morris believes also that Kennedy was shot from the front. So there's a, you know, means two, two shooters. If you believe shot was from, if he believes it was a shot from the front, did he explain where, what, if it was from the knoll or not? He did not. Did he ever talk about the work of the HSCA proving probable conspiracy in later investigations? I know you don't have that in your writing. I'm just wondering if you asked that. No, you know, I didn't ask him his thoughts on the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Maybe I should have, but um, we didn't. We didn't get into that. He just felt that um, Oswald's motive. He had a motive to, to gain prominence and to do something that he thought in his own twisted way was important for history. Based on your information and the work you've done on the assassination, do you think Oswald was manipulated in any sense that he had a part in this and wasn't just a lone or it wasn't just a patsy like everyone else kind of fights for? Yeah, I definitely think he was manipulated and used for sure.
I think there's varying perspectives, and I think they all equal weight, especially everybody's thoughts on the... Like, I didn't know Walter Coughlin, who my grandmama is married, a Secret Service agent for JFK. I had never heard him ever speak about the assassination, but the Sixth Floor Museum did an interview with him, and he was very difficult at answering questions. It seemed like he would, like, not hear questions on purpose on certain ones. Where I was like, come on. I mean, they said it at the same volume. But then he kind of went into like when people kept pressing him about who do you think was else involved, he started leaning more towards the mob. Now, I respect the work of the HSCA. I know a lot of people don't because it does point at the mob. But I mean, you had Blakey in charge of it. That was just going to head that way. If you were going to be looking for evidence, you have the main guy who created like the RICO Act involved in looking at organized crime. But to me, it was just interesting to hear these people that are actual government officials that were actually making statements just different than what the official narrative gave. And a lot of people did that. Yeah, you're right, Robbie. I mean, over the last few years, we 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 find out that, you know, most of the Warren commissioners had doubts. The only one that really didn't was Alan Dulles. And of course, uh, that shouldn't be surprising, seeing he was uh, former head of the CIA, and it's my understanding that he stayed in close contact with uh, those still in the agency. But yeah, you know, and you have the interview with uh, LBJ, you know, that was uh, bleeped out initially, and later came out that you know he he didn't believe it. He didn't didn't believe it either that Oswald acted alone. I think he said something like, "I I've never been completely relieved that others might have been involved." Uh, I just think uh, there was a real fear of what could happen. And I, it makes me wonder, um, were we that close to a military that was out of control? I don't think we would recognize it. I don't think a lot of people were as connected. At, like if we had a lot of this, if this happened now in today's time, it, you would I think that my generation wouldn't care, but that the exposure and so many devices and the usage of the internet, I think it would completely change the game on getting truth out there. I think the reason why that it's lasted this long is because the internet has pushed it out there for so many varying factors, whether you believe whoever did it or not. But the resources are so available. You can just say Gerald Ford edited a report to move the back wound up six inches, and anybody can Google that on their phone and see the first articles that pop up about it. Yeah. Well, it's, I, it just makes me wonder um, about, you know, the Seven days in May. I think I think that's about yeah. what we were. That's about what Kennedy was dealing with. And plus, if you had the internet, you didn't have to look through the yellow pages to be able to try and find somebody. You could easily just call them up or email them. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to get into this or not at all, but, um, you know, at the end of the first interview, like I said, that was pretty much about, you know, how'd you get to Washington? Tell me about your relationship with John Sherman Cooper. And, and we got into Spectre. And um, so we're just about done with the interview. And he, and Morris says, uh, you know, someday I'll have to tell you about a day uh, that I spent in the Oval Office um, with President Kennedy in 1963. And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do that. And, and as you know, we did. And we've talked some about that. But then again, uh, <clears throat> At the end of the interview for the second um, part of the, uh, the the column, just kind of right at the end again, um, he mentions CIA Director William Colby. I don't know if you want to get into that. Oh, 100% we're getting into William Colby. <laughs> okay. Well, he just talked about <clears throat> that, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, what just you've met so many people and had such an interesting life and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, yeah, one of my friends was former CIA director, William Colby. Like, oh, really? And uh, he said that his closeness with Colby was based on um, a mutual passion for, for peace. And uh, that um, he couldn't remember the specifics, but, you know, I, I looked it up and, and that Colby was found dead in May 6th of 96 with a canoeing accident. And that the official investigation was that, <clears throat> you know, there was no foul play involved. But Wolf definitely thinks otherwise, as do others. And he said that Colby was just a, a true, really dear friend and such an interesting guy. And they sh shared the same values. 
and had a great friendship. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't say unprompted by me. He said about Colby's death being accidental. He said, no way. He said somebody had it in for him. And uh, that had a very sharp mind and he saw possibilities for peace. And so that got me to thinking about how Colby was viewed back in the days when he was CIA director. And, you know, he he's basically re responsible for making public the CIA's, the family jewels, as they call them. And uh, I saw uh, Colby make a, a statement that we have to abandon the old tradition of total secrecy. So that, you know, would not have endeared him to the rest of the mindset of the CIA at that time. And so um, we would talk and kind of end our conversation, and then I would call him back and see if he had anything more to say. And and each time I did that, Morris did have just a little bit more to say. And one time I asked him, I said, you got anything else that you want to tell me about DCI Colby's death? <clears throat> and surprisingly, he said to me, not now. These guys have long memories, and I want to stay alive. They don't play fair. They don't play above the belt. And the government has not been honest with us about Colby or about the JFK assassination. And I'm hoping to live long enough to see it corrected. Well, then in a third conversation, again, just seeing if Morse would say anything else um, about Colby, he said that, uh, let me see what he said here exactly. He may have been strangled by physically capable members of the Green Beret and then a cover up by underlings at CIA. And for now, that's where we've left it. Hmm. Do you know much about the William Colby, the whole death scenario at his house and everything? I, you know, I, I just, not a lot, Robbie, not a lot. I, you know, just certainly not anything. I'm sure we all don't off, know the facts. The, yeah, I don't yeah. have anything like off the record ish. Yeah. Just that, you know, when they went to his house, you know, there was, it looked, the circumstances certainly didn't seem like a guy who was about to go out and commit suicide, which is what I think his son thinks. And it's my understanding that that his uh, Colby's former wife doesn't think uh, he was. Killed. She was the one who voiced her opinion in the beginning because she had just gotten off the phone with him. And I think it was like 10 something at night, uh, allegedly, is when she talked to him on the phone and he had gotten up in the middle of eating his dinner. And decided to go kayaking, which look, people make impulsive decisions, but that is a strange maneuver you just mark down on the list of like, that's just a strange thing to do. But when they investigated his house, a friend was, I forgot who the guy's name was. And this is information I got from John Ranley when he was on my show after I talked to Jefferson Morley. I also asked Jefferson Morley this, if he thought that death was suspicious. And he says he does put more weight into it than he used to. Yeah, um, the which same is, thing to me. Basically the same thing to me, too. Yeah, so when I spoke with John Ranley, he said that a friend had investigated that accident that night, and he said that he found it suspicious that this guy had worked for the CIA for however many years. I can't rattle off the number off the top of my head, but he said that the doors were unlocked to his house. He didn't think to lock the doors behind him. If he knew it was just going to be him that night in his home eating dinner, he just leaves his doors unlocked. So you must be waiting for somebody. But – that, like I said, I mean, if you really watch those church committee videos now, knowing William Colby's death, you see a guy with his hands crossed and he's sitting there look like he's about to beat a bunch of sweat off of his head. He's not scared so much of what the government or America is going to know about what the CIA is doing. He knows that what he's doing right now is going to be getting into some deep shit with some people around him. Yes, it sir. You puts you're those exactly videos right. in a different perspective when you watch them. And I'm like, yeah, we don't really. You know, we look at it like, oh, yeah, you're doing your justice and telling the American people the truth. I'm like, yeah, well, they put a lot on the line like every other whistleblower does when they go and blow a secret. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with all that, Robbie. And, uh, you know, somebody said to me while I was doing these interviews and poking around trying to learn some more. <clears throat> somebody said, well, you know, Colby let the cat out of the bag, the family jewels back in the mid 70s and he dies in 96. Why would somebody want him? killed you know 20 years later and i don't know that i have a great answer for that but what i said was and we'll say to you and i have no evidence of this but maybe colby was about to 
say more. I don't know that he had uh, plans to do that. But, um, you know, I think it's a legitimate question. Why 20 years later do we think he was murdered? But maybe that's why. Maybe there was more that he was going to talk about. Again, that's complete speculation on my part. I'm sure there's a lot going on. I mean, the CIA heart attack gun is just the craziest thing you can possibly, you know, and they slide that sucker across the table. But uh, if you really like I had a episode I did with a guy from the UK who's an academic who looks into like it just intelligence activities. And he wrote a book called why like it's something about CIA memoirs. How can CIA people write memoirs about their time in the CIA? And I asked him about the William Colby thing, and he said it was suspicious. But one of the things he mentioned to me, which I think is some interesting information for you and then anybody else that might find this interesting, if you like the CIA stuff, which is that he read, uh, is it, oh man, I'm going to blank on the man's name. It's not John McCone. Who was the director of the CIA? Helms. Uh, Hel Richard Helms. Yes, Richard Helms. So he wrote his whole book about CIA's writing their memoirs was based on Helms's memoir his book that he wrote and he goes if you look at the cia memoirs of all these ex-directors the, the guys have the same names the the ghostwriter the person that rewrites or looks through their work and then it's kind of self-published by the director and then it's underlinged and it's edited by this one person so unless the guy's a vampire and he just lives for you know centuries upon centuries upon centuries it's just a, a random name obviously it's a pen name but he mentioned he goes and if you look at the rough drafts which are in the archives of uh helms's writings he talks about through my time as cia director we participated in thousands of covert operations thousands but if you look at the final cut the final cut says dozens so mm -hmm. there's a big difference between thousands and then dozens. But what they saw as a difference or an adjustment to the lettering in the final draft was that switching that thousands to dozens. Now, that gives me goosebumps saying that because you got to really look at how many documents do we read now and we go, oh, my God, they did dozens. It's like, well, hold on. if you repeat it back to the rough draft when he's speaking free, flo free flow of thought, which is probably the most honest answers possible before the mm -hmm. filters come in. <laughs> thousands is a drastic difference and a major well, change well you know you're much younger than i i just turned 74 the other day you look fantastic you're nowhere close you're nowhere close to that so you're going to learn things that i'll be dead and gone i mean things will continue to trickle out um not just about jfk but some of these other thousands of things um it just makes you wonder what's going on right now, March of nineteen of uh, twenty twenty four, that we have no clue about. Because there's, I'm sure there's something going on. Yeah, but that'll come out when I'm seventy four, and then there'll be Could another be. generation looking Could at be. that. Yeah, I hope you make it to at least that long. <laughs> we'll find out. There's a giant Dippin' Dot scandal, and I'm I, I was way past it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, um, you'll find out. Jeff was in MK Ultra, and I'm just feeding you a bunch of crap. No. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, um, mentioning Helms, um, I'll say this. I just, um, a, a couple of months ago, just for the heck of it, I re-listened to all of Helms' testimony before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And while I'm listening to it, I'm paging through it because I have the House Select Committee volumes. And um, it just amazes me how arrogant he was. And uh, for the most part, pretty much got away with it. And um, I think you alluded to this a little few minutes ago about how some of these guys are really great at answering questions without saying anything. Yeah. I mean, just uh, I think that's an art that uh, maybe it's a class that politicians have to take before they assume office. Um, trying to get answers from him uh, were difficult. And, you know, he got he gave pushback at times and just. I was just really surprised at the arrogance of Richard Helms before um, a body of investigators like that. Well, does from your generation perspective, do you look at these people when they go into congressional investigations, much like I think my generation probably does and thinks that they're going to tell the truth? Because from the same work of his name is Christopher Moran, the UK researcher who did the book on Helms, he was able to lie and get away with it in those court proceedings. And that is a thing for the CIA if it's in duty to the service of the country, if it's a bigger issue. 
where lying has to be the thing that's justifiable. And that's what he was still following technically the statute of the CIA's charter. But if you ask the CIA to show their charter, they don't show it. They don't even show their budget. When William Colby asked about it, he was like, hey, do you mind just letting us see where your money's getting funneled into? And the CIA is like, I don't think that's uh, reasonable for, you know, us to be able to show. That's why they had two people sitting. If you look at those uh, recordings with William Colby, they had two people right beside him because they didn't want him exposing too much. He could expose a little bit, but there's still a fine line of when we have to cut him off and get him to stop talking. But um, your generation yeah, there's, looking there's at a, it. There's an art to that. You know, if you read Jefferson Morley's book, um, what is it called? Scorpion something or other? Scorpion's Dance or something? Or Scorpion's Dance, yes, about Helms and Nixon. Uh, to your point about, you know, you, you give a little, but you don't give the whole thing. You know, you, you read in there, at least my take, you know, uh, Nixon wants to know more from Helms about the CIA and the Kennedy assassination. And Helms doesn't give it. And Nixon says, you know, I've been a supporter and, uh, you know, I know things. And Helms doesn't give Nixon what he wants, but he gives him information instead on Diem's murder. So those guys are really good at playing games like that. Can I ask your opinion on Nixon? When I say that is, I think I have a different take than most Kennedy researchers. Nixon could have blew the stack on anybody and involved in the intelligence agencies. He had been understanding what the CIA was up to when it came to overthrowing other governments. He had involved in, or at least knowledge of so many operations from Truman's administration. He might not have been... I wouldn't say he's not a dope as much as everyone says he is, but the fact that he didn't blow the stack shows me that he's the perfect example of a Boy Scout when you know what a Boy Scout is. So what are you asking me? What are your What's your opinion on Nixon? Obviously, it's changed, I think, through the years now. He's kind of gotten a little bit of a different hot take on him. Well, I think um, I think you're right that Nixon knew a lot about a lot of things. Um that he never spoke about that we, as the public, um, know about. I think he, he uh, for whatever reasons, and I'm not going to get into psychology, but um, he was a real paranoid. Um, you know, he just mistrusted the media and uh, anybody that spoke out uh, negatively about him joined an enemies list. And he, he's just a very paranoid person. And, um, you know, if you look at the Nixon Frost interviews, it's just amazing how Nixon dances around questions that Frost threw at him. And um, he just, to me, Nixon could could never, like he uh, just, he just played games with Frost about, now, what do you mean, what do you mean specifically about obstruction of justice? And... Uh, that was, you know, if obstruction of justice just has to do with uh, political. And this wasn't political. And just uh, how they can just dance around things like that. And in front of those investigative, co congressional investigative bodies, you know, Helms and many others, they just get away with not answering things. And, and here, here's another thing that just strikes me. Uh, when I was writing my second book, on the Kennedy assassination called The Manipulation of Lee Harvey Oswald and the cover-up that followed. I include in there um, something that, um, oh gosh, we talk about blanking out on names. Uh, Schumer, Chuck Schumer said in an MSNBC interview, and this was, I believe it was around 2017, if I remember right, and it's when Trump was really poking holes really poking at the CIA and how terrible their uh, job, the terrible job they were doing. And Schumer said, uh, you know, President Trump is really stupid for doing that because the CIA has more ways than Sundays to get back at you. Yeah. And I'm like, what? How would you know that? You have either had that experience I'm or someone just told you that. I mean, I thought that was really very telling. And I think Schumer uh, might have realized that what he said, he, maybe he shouldn't have said, because, you know, a second and a half later, he's praising the CIA for what a great job they do. But when he said that, uh, you know, Trump is really stupid for doing that because the CIA has more ways to get back at you than 
there are Sundays. And what's like, what? What's the George Carlin George Carlin joke where he talks about when they get a new president in office, they bring him into a room, they show him the Zapruder film, and then afterwards they flick the lights on, put a gun on the table, and they say, "Any questions?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think everyone kind of knows that you don't mess with these intelligence agencies. I just think, like for instance, if you look at Nixon, his issue was that. He thought since he was the president, he would control these agencies. And I think if you look at the documentation, these agencies run on their own. And that's kind of one of the most dangerous things because they don't communicate. And they kind of – I mean one of the most secret ones that I have not seen a whole lot of work done books-wise, which is the NSA. How come nobody's speaking about what the NSA is doing or any of their intelligence documents? I mean their stuff related to the JFK assassination is actually probably more incriminating to what's going on besides the documents from the FBI and CIA's. I have an uh, NSA t-shirt with the symbol on it, and it says uh, National Security Agency, the only, the only agency that truly listens. Yeah, I know, right? Everything is. <laughs> and I, I run a history club uh, once a month here where we live, and uh, one of the uh, attendees who lives here used to work for the NSA, but she doesn't talk much about it. <laughs> They are a secretive agency, but I mean, through yeah, and you know, Robbie, if, if I may, um, Schumer's comment, it just it was kind of validation for me that these politicians, in my this is just my opinion, these politicians know more than what they say, and they have good reason to fear the CIA. And if a law can be passed in 1992 to release documents on the Kennedy assassination, and it's now 2024, and they still haven't, you tell me who runs the country. No, oh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And honestly, if you really look at it from that perspective and kind of examine all the work that people have done for 60 years or when people comment and ask, why aren't you asking hard-hitting questions to this person who might have some information? I'm like, what do you expect them to divulge? What A lot of people aren't going to put their lives on the line. A lot of people aren't going to put their families and careers on the line. It's just not going to happen. You really examine it from the information that slowly leaks out. That's the best we're really going to get. I mean, hopefully we can keep that leak, keep keep on going until all the information does come out. But we And another thing I think that kind of goes along with this, I think, is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So in many instances, you don't know what to ask. I mean, like, for instance, do you have any conflicts or anything that you have? whether it's the assassination, whether it's about a presidency, whether it's about anything that you just don't know about anymore that has changed throughout time? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll give you an example. I asked you about Nixon. Can you explain to me why the Watergate burglary happened? A, a definitive conclusion that this is why the burglary happened, because there is no definitive conclusion. From every Watergate historian and every Nixon historian, every JFK person I've ever talked to, there's not a definitive as to why Watergate happened. There's theories. But there's not a definitive of how some CIA people working for Richard Nixon can get caught by using tape on a door. And then when it gets ripped off, they put it back on the door. That's not low level, guys. These people had done CIA ops and coups in other countries. That's just there's not an explanation to that. And if you can't look into that because you're so afraid of being a Nixon supporter or anything like that, you have to challenge that. So that I'm just asking from your point. You don't have to talk about Nixon. You can talk about anything else through history, but something in your mind that. For me, when I thought I was in high school, I thought Nixon was this. Now I'm kind of learning. I'm like, I just think everyone's kind of like not corrupt, but it's all complicated, extremely complicated. Compromised. Yeah, that's a good word. That's a word that comes to my mind. But yeah, uh, about the why, uh, you know, I don't know that we'll ever know the real reason why, but um, I have nine of the Watergate, nine volumes of the Watergate hearings, and it. The answer to that question depends on who who you ask. They have these different <laughs> reasons about why why yeah. did you do this? Why did why did you decide to take on this assignment? And so, to your point, Robbie, there is no clear, definitive, uh, for sure answer. Who's your favorite president, or not president? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, who's your favorite president? I would say Ronald Reagan. And just uh, 
Did you like his comedy? He had some good comedy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he had a sense of humor. Um, I liked his feistiness. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I mean, he was really, he, you know, he revered World War II veterans, which was, you know, uh, big, big to me and had, a, I don't remember, but I think he made a real uh, great speech over at Normandy in uh, 1984. Um, I think what you saw is what you got. Um he was just in my opinion, he was he was less less political, less afraid to to say what was on his mind. Um, I think he's the last, I'll use the word great president we've had. I think so many of the past presidential elections, um, you know, it's are just, you know, this is who we're stuck with. And from what I hear, 70% of a, <clears throat> the electorate um, doesn't want Trump or Biden. But yet, here we are again. We're trying to, you know, choose between two candidates that nobody's really wild about for whatever reasons. And, you know, then uh, RFK is is jumped into the fold. Um, I don't know that he has much of a chance. Um because, you know, the powers that be will work like hell to keep him from having a chance. But uh, I would say Reagan. Can you guess my favorite? No. <laughs> I'm going to probably say Truman. Um, uh, Truman crossed my mind, but I wasn't going to say it. There's Jim, another guy who spoke his mind. Yeah, yeah. And I think who's finally getting some uh, correct recognition. We Carter. Were Jimmy Carter. Oh, that's your that's your favorite. Well, I mean, I would take a second look at him. I I deem favorites in this aspect. I deem favorites about what can be said when they know they can't say something or it can have ramifications. And I think Truman, with his statements about Dag Hammarskjöld, when he said to the press, he said, "Notice that he was on the verge of getting something done when they killed him." Notice how I said they. That's an exact quote where he stops and says, "Notice how I said they," and no press followed up on that. And then also, well, and his, then and then the column he had come out on how the CIA, yeah. this is not what I had in mind for the CIA. And Alan Dulles said to smear that and call it that it was uh, just a taken out of context or something, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, that's that's and, important. And, and met with Truman, right, to get him to try yeah. to say. try and recant his thoughts on that. Yeah. And see, now there's, there's, there's that. There's Kennedy, who's disgusted with the CIA. You know, 40 years later, the CIA is not letting documents out. After a 1992 law says that you you have to or you have to explain why, so I you know I asked the it just makes you know ten years ago I didn't believe in the deep state. I do now. Welcome to the club, man. It's fun. I believe I deep state's a harsh word. Let's try like military industrial complex, or we could take it back to like the old days, the establishment. That was a good one. We should have never given it up. The invisible government. Yeah, that's a good one too. There's a book, yeah, The Invisible Government. I think if you look at the intelligence agencies, that has more evidence to support that than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, they are out of control. I, I know you've talked about this in the past, so I won't have you do it on this episode, but we will do an episode um, in honor of Jim Gokenauer because uh, – yeah, okay. Tragic passing, and he had a lot of information. We were trying to schedule some other things. He had called me actually three days before everything when when I found out, um, which sucks because uh, yeah. that's why it's important to get you guys on the record and get you guys talking about stuff. I still got to get with Phil Singer at some point to try and do this, but he's not a technology guy, so we got to work out a day that fits our schedules. Um, yeah. But Phil, Mr. Meek Phil knew Phil knew uh, Jim very very well. Phil is who put me in touch with Jim, and um, as you know, I did. Two-part story with uh, Jim as well. Very passionate guy uh, about his experiences, and uh, he's really a good guy. I hate to see him go. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Beak, I appreciate the time you gave me out of your day to be able to do this. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? And I'll make sure I link them in the description below. Say that again. I couldn't hear you. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? And I'll make sure I link that in the description below. You know, I don't have a website. I don't have a blog. I don't have any of that. Uh, if they contact the Hot Springs Village Voice newspaper, that's one way to get in touch with me, and I can send out uh, columns uh, to people who are interested. And um, 
the number there is 501-209. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's 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 my number. And maybe they wouldn't want me to give out their number. Yeah, but let's if you, maybe, if, you, yeah, if, you yeah. if you Google the Hot Springs Village Voice newspaper in Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, uh, and people do this, they they contact the office. The office lets me know that someone's been in touch and um uh, I uh, I get back to them. And my email address at the office is jmeek at hsv v-o-i-c-e dot com jmeek at hsvvoice.com and I, i'll be glad to send out any of the columns that i've written um recently they just put up a firewall so um, you'd have to get a subscription and some people have that follow the column very closely um but it's kind of willy-nilly it's usually once a month but and we're a weekly newspaper we come out on tuesday mornings it, it might be in the second Tuesday one month, and it might be in the third, the next. There's, there's just no, uh, it's all, in the newspaper world, It's things are space-related, as space is available. And, uh, you know, I write other things. I write the, the veterans column, which also, there's a page for that kind of stuff that I write. And sometimes it's on veterans. Sometimes it's on the uh, Kennedy assassination. But if they send me a an email or they contact, call the office. I'd, I'd be glad to get in touch with folks who uh, want to see some of the other writings. And many of them, if I may, um, are in the th third book I did on the Kennedy assassination called The JFK Files, Pieces of the Assassination Puzzle. I have copies of that here uh, at home. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon. Um, there might someday be a volume two. Uh, I've certainly I've done about another dozen or so interviews since that printed last fall. Uh, but that's uh, that's a lot of the work that I've done is in that book, the JFK Files. And um, if you're looking for a book that tells you what to think, you don't want to buy it. Uh, if you look at Amazon, you'll see one review that says there's there's nothing in here one way or the other. Well. Um, that's what journalism is, people. Uh, maybe not so much anymore. Um, I've obtained information and I've shared it. Uh, and you can you can believe it. You can disagree with it. You can do whatever. That's what journalism is. I've obtained information. I'm sharing it with people who are interested. And you can draw your own conclusion. Of the many, many writings I've done on the Kennedy assassination, it's very rare that I, I put my two cents in. Very rare. But if you want to see what Ruth Payne says when I ask her, were you involved with the CIA, you'd be interested in that book. Am I going to tell you that I think, uh, you know, Richard Helms is a liar or, or whatever? I, I just don't put my opinion in there much. That's not what journalism, at least that's what journalism was and what journalism should be. That's a rambling answer, but there it is. That's another way if people want to read about my interviews and hear what was said, they could, they could also buy that book, The JFK Files, Pieces of the Assassination Puzzle. It's a, it's a, Jimmy Diagenio wrote a really nice, unsolicited to me, somebody else told me it was on uh, Kennedy's and King, uh, wrote a really nice piece about the book um, that, you know, there's just a lot of good information in there. If you want to know what Jeff Morley thinks or John Thunheim thinks or what uh, Ruth Payne said when I grilled her about being in the CIA, um, you'll enjoy that book. Well, I'll link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, and thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Battle Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.